Good morning, uh, everyone again. I'm Valeria Galli and I'm currently employed at CIOPS and part of uh, PIC as of uh, mid-2019. Today, I'm going to talk to you about the optimization of the choice and configuration of hard valve prosthesis and the case of TAVI more specifically. So first, just a brief introduction on the clinical problem, then I will dive in TAVI and the optimization of the device indeed. Um, patient-specific computer simulation to pave the way for the last and most important topic, which is my own work on uh, mechanistic and statistical modeling for outcome prediction in TAVI. So valvular heart disease is a, a quite an important social and uh, clinical problem, especially in the elderly population where around 13% uh, are affected uh, above 75 years old. And a death rate in Europe, for example, is around four people in 100,000 population. You can see on the graph on the right the percentage of deaths by valve uh, in the US. This is uh, from 2017. And you can see the aortic valve is the most prevalent. Uh, so today I'm going to focus my talk on that. Uh, and also my work is focused on that. Um, so the causes for our disease can be uh, manifold. For example, rheumatic from infection or degenerative from classification or uh, congenital diseases like bicuspid valve. Treatment options uh, um, are, can be pharmacological, which is only a relief of symptoms, um, and most commonly repair and replacement are needed. And this can either uh, use a surgical approach, uh, like in the beginning of these interventions, or a transcatheter approach from the early 2000s. And we're going to focus specifically on the transcatheter uh, aortic valve implantation, or sometimes called the transcatheter aortic valve replacement. Uh, which has some advantages over the surgical approach, for example, the minimally invasive uh, fashion that allows for a faster recovery and also uh, a clinical, clinically overall equivalent to uh, surgery in uh, um, reducing stenosis and cost effective in the, in the long run by reducing the hospital stay. Uh, and the trend indeed in Europe, this is data from uh, the European Society of Cardiology, um, tells us that from the early days when only higher risk or uh, inoperable patients were um, uh, sent for TAVI. Today, lower risk uh, and younger patients are treated, which also poses new uh, challenges for the devices. Um, and indeed, the, there is a better of devices on the market, both in clinical uh, ongoing studies and already available commercially and clinically. Uh, there are three main designs, so the balloon expandable, the self-expandable, and the other designs. Uh, some of them are already approved in the, in the US and others in the European Union. Uh, sometimes also devices are recalled from the market for various uh, issues and problems. So you see it's a dynamic market. And for example, now also this Venus valve uh, in China, uh, it's a kind of new market in China. Uh, so uh, you saw a, a large variety of devices and there are also a variety of factors to take into account when choosing the proper device for each patient. First of all, the hemodynamics uh, that is uh, directly related to the long-term durability because we want, of course, to reduce the mean pressure gradient uh, that is increased with the stenosis. And this goes together with a larger effective orifice area of the valve. And we need to avoid a valvular leak, which is uh, um, impairing the hemodynamic of the valve and its durability. Um, and the anatomy is very important because each and every patient has his own calcification and location of this calcification. And the annular size and shape are crucial for the, for the choice of the device. Uh, vascular ac access is also a discriminant uh, sometimes between TAVI and surgical approach because sometimes it's not possible or it would be too difficult to go through the femoral artery all the way to the aorta. Uh, there is a risk of coronary occlusion that is uh, maybe rare but uh, a fatal um, outcome. Risk of damaging the conduction system of the electrical signal through the heart, which is uh, what I will explain more in detail later and particular cases like uh, bicuspid valves or valving valve operations, which you can imagine are more complex than a simple uh, TAVI. So with this great variety of device uh, choice, uh, shape and size, and the huge variability of patient's anatomy that uh, you probably all know if you've seen uh, CT images or echo images from patients, uh, then how do we actually choose the optimal device? The standard planning, is to use uh, uh, cardiac CT images to measure uh, relevant landmarks and then sometimes geometric superimposition of device uh, or simple cylinders that uh, simulate, well, represent the device from a geometrical point of view. But you can imagine that in certain difficult cases or borderline anatomies, uh, 
um, where this uh, is not completely uh, maybe uh, safe or secure, then uh, there is a need for uh, an additional tool for planning. And this is where the patient specific simulation steps in. I'm sorry. Okay. So uh, this takes into account the anatomy and the material properties of the anatomy, the calcium exact location and its material properties, and also more importantly, the device anatomy interaction. As Peter already showed uh, last morning, I will just quickly summarize this. Uh, we start from CT images and uh, build a 3D model of the anatomy. You see the aortic root in uh, pink here, and the leaflets, uh, the reconstructed leaf leaflets of the valve and the classification in gray black here. And then the FEA, finite element analysis models of devices with the material properties. How to have, of course, this is very complex, but just to give you an overview, allow to have uh, the frame deformation inside of that specific or of that patient. And from this, we can extract, for example, the contact pressure, uh, which is very important relating to the damage to the production system of the heart and the paravalvular leak with the computational fluid dynamics. So just to give you a quick uh, example of how this can be useful, this is a porcelain aorta with massive classifications all over. Uh, so it's difficult to, uh, to uh, see where a device could have a suitable landing zone. Uh, in this case, uh, there was a Lotus device uh, chosen by the clinician and we provided with two different positions. And you can see uh, there are the quantities that I just showed. So this contact pressure with this region this ROI, a region of interest, is very important for what I will explain later about my work. And it is where we believe the, uh, we identify the anatomical location of the conduction system and where it's relevant to measure the contact pressure because this is the region where uh, damage can occur on the contact system of the heart. Uh, also, the acquisition of the skirt of the device and the paravalvular leak are taken into account. And based on this number, then the clinician can decide, for example, I will aim for a high implantation. And in this case, there was a, a good result indeed of the procedure uh, with no new abnormalities, because you can see uh, this region of interest here is not subjected to pressure according to our simulation. So indeed, um, there, were no, uh, there was no damage to the conduction system. Another example can be for, uh, when we have massive subannular classification, like in this case. So paravalvular leakage is a concern because if this is too high, then the valve is not uh, hemodynamically uh, functioning um, optimally. Uh, and also in this case, for example, there was a borderline sizing from the sizing chart that the manufacturer provides, for example, this from um, Medtronic Evolute system. So again, the simulation can give a better insight to the clinician. And in this case, I would like to show you uh, how from the postoperative angiography that you see in the middle, um, there was a very good match between the prediction uh, of the simulation and the postoperative result of the implantation. And again, this was also a case where uh, there was a good um, outcome of the procedure. And uh, now comes uh, the best part, I think, <laughs> that is, uh, I tried myself to uh, put into uh, action the very nice concept of the digital twin. I did not take part uh, as actively as other others have because I wasn't part of PIC yet, but I'm uh, a very uh, great fan of this. So I tried myself to declinate this uh, um, synergistic approach of mechanistic model and statistical modeling to build a more uh, powerful insight in the uh, heart. So. Um, this uh, is the work that I've been doing in collaboration with Philip on personalized prediction of conduction abnormalities after TAVI interventions. Uh, and we drafted a manuscript that is currently under review and almost ready for submission. So uh, the clinical problem, once again, I showed you that region of interest and here anatomically, maybe it's more clear. So um, you see the MS, the blue uh, in the in picture A is the membrane septum. Uh, and where the membrane septum ends, uh, there is uh, the, this is the point where the left bundle branch emerges from the ventricular septum in pink here. So it's the point where danger uh, arises, so to speak, because if the device is implanted in the aortic root and say maybe this membrane septum is shorter and the device ends up where the left bundle branch emerges from the ventricular septum, then of course, there is damage of there is a risk of damaging uh, this le left bundle branch, and 
the most common adver out adverse outcome of TAVI is uh, indeed the damage to left bundle branch block or atrioventricular block. And uh, this uh, then leads to the need of a permanent pacemaker implantation, which of course is undesirable, is an undesirable outcome for this operation. So uh, what we tried to do is to start from uh, clinical data, so the device chosen by the clinician and the preoperative images and the prosperative angiograms, so this is a retrospective study, um, and build the patient-specific computer simulation, so the mechanistic modeling here on the left, and then uh, we assessed indeed the interaction between the device frame and the patient anatomy, and combine this with the statistical modeling of supervised machine learning, to build on the one hand the patient-specific prediction and on the other hand the population-based pattern exploration towards a personalized prediction of the conduction abnormalities in TAVI. So a little bit more on the input data. Uh, we have a clinical baseline, so sex age and pre-existing abnormalities, and then anatomical uh, data from the CT images where we can have the aortic uh, annulus size and the membrane septum characteristics, um, and then patient-specific simulations of each and every patient. Um, and then the procedural characteristics, so which device was implanted, which size, and the depth of implantation. Here there is a first disclaimer because um, our data came from nine different European centers. So you can imagine if you work with clinical data that there is no, it's not a clean and neat database that you receive uh, with all the features for all the patients, but we had mixed uh, features in the different data sets from different centers, so we had to merge them. For example, we did not have data on sex and age for all the patients, but we did have, and it's very important, data on pre-existing abnormalities, and we considered this to be an exclusion criteria from the study to avoid the bias of uh, having indeed this pre-existing abnormality and starting from clean uh, ECG patients with a clean ECG at baseline. It's also important to point out here, for example, that in comparison with other works in literature, we did not have other clinical baseline, for example, uh, on uh, kidney disease or other uh, scores or other um, clinical laboratory data. So uh, we wanted to predict a binary outcome. So it's essentially a supervised uh, uh, machine learning classi binary classification. And on the one hand, no new conduction abnormalities after TAVI, so zero or one new conduction abnormalities, that is one of these three that I listed here. So a new uh, left bundle branch block, or a new right bundle branch block, or a new pacemaker implantation. And here we have a second disclaimer, because pacemaker implantation is not an, ob an objective endpoint, as can be, for example, the assessment of a branch block from an ECG, because there are variable thresholds in different centers or clinicians. Um, and this will, uh, I will come back on this uh, in a minute. Uh, so uh, to give you a more graphical idea of the anatomical landmarks, we indeed consider the inferior border of the membrane septum because you can imagine it's not a, it's not a line, but it's a 3D structure. So we try to capture the 3D nature of this by taking into account the length and the angulation with respect to the annulus, as you can see in figure A. And also we uh, uh, tracked this region of interest that I showed before. With these three landmarks, P1, P2, P3, um, and then up, uh, constructing a plane 15 millimeters below the under plane to be sure to um, also include the emerging uh, of the uh, LBBB. And the mechanistic modeling uh, that I uh, briefly showed before uh, gave us two uh, main variables as an outcome. So the maximum magnitude of pressure in the region of interest and the percentage of the region of interest with pressure. Uh, so the workflow is as follows. Uh, we start uh, indeed from data from nine different centers. We gather the variables that are available for patients. So we ended up with a 151 um, patients. And there is also a disclaimer here because, uh, of course, I know that some of you work in machine learning and you would be wondering, this is very little data set. But uh, indeed, there is. this is uh, data from uh, clinical, from patients, and you have to think that for uh, each of these 150, we have simulations. So it's not simply gathering data from a table, so to speak, but there is also massive work behind it. So uh, this is to say, I know it's not a thousand uh, data points, but on the other hand, it's a very valuable data, I believe. 
Um, then the pre-processing consisted of one hot encoding of categorical data, which in this case was only the device type. Um, and you can see it's also not a balanced uh, uh, data set from the point of view of the device uh, uh, type. And then uh, uh, scaling, so normalization of this numerical data and feature selection. Um, and then data splitting in training set and uh, validation set, 70-30%. Um, then I tried uh, many different uh, binary classification algorithms, uh, and I call them single classification algorithms, because, because after a five-fold cross-validation, what I try to do to enhance the performance is to use assembling methods that basically um, are methods that try to combine single algorithms, for example, combine K and N um, in a homogeneous way, so multiple times K and N, or a heterogeneous way, so for example, K and N and logistic regression. And this is respectively bootstrap aggregation or voting classification. And um, the best performing combined model was then used to estimate the risk of post-operative conduction abnormalities on the validation set. Uh, the results were pretty satisfactory, I think, considering, uh, again, that the data set is not that uh, large and also we did not have many clinical baseline variables. Uh, so the um, accuracy we obtained is 83% uh, with the area under the curve of 0.84. And as I mentioned before, PP, uh, it could be argued that PPI, the permanent pacemaker implantation, is not uh, an objective endpoint. So we also... Uh, ran an analysis on a, a subset, uh, on a sub of 118 patients, and this excluded indeed the patients with uh, PPI, but uh, we only considered patients that develop uh, LBBB after TAVI. Uh, so accuracy is a bit lower, but still, I think, satisfactory. Um, it's also in comparison with previous work that was done um, still in FIOPS, but not using machine learning. Uh, where accuracy was indeed around 75%. So to conclude, uh, I would like to uh, give the TRICOM message that patient-specific approach enables a more informed and optimized choice of device for TAVI uh, from the point of view of size, but also position of implantation uh, towards um, having a better sizing and ex uh, avoid the risk of exaggerated oversizing and also towards optimizing the results in terms of uh, paravalvular leak or contact pressure, so uh, that relates to damage to the conduction system. And most importantly, the synergistic between mechanistic and statistical modeling, uh, excuse me, the synergy between mechanistic and statistical modeling uh, allowed to have a powerful prediction of a very common uh, adverse outcome of TAVI. Uh, so despite having not so many uh, data points, we could obtain a good accuracy. Uh, thanks to the me mechanistic insight. Um, I would like to thank my uh, team at FIOPS, which is a very nice work environment, and I'm really happy to be there, and especially my supervisor, Peter Mottier, that uh, has guided me through all this uh, path in PIC, and also for this work specifically, uh, Philip, of course, that I'm collaborating with, and the other supervisors of this work. And thank you for your attention as well. Okay, thank you, Valeria. <clears throat> Any questions from the audience? No? So I have a question. So what, what would be the next step? Would this be a prospective trial or do you have any idea what your next steps would be with regard to the modeling or the workflow? Thanks, it's a very good question. So well, our idea uh, ultimately would be to include this as a predictive tool uh, indeed for perspective purposes. So once the model is built and we may need more patient, more data points to build a more uh, robust model, um, we would like to use this uh, as a predictive tool because uh, as of today, the index that is given to the clinicians is that contact pressure index that I showed from the simulations, but it's not a very, uh, how do we say, uh, user-friendly uh, quantity, but maybe it would be easier for a clinician to have a probability of developing conduction abnormalities as an index, which is easier to understand. So yes, in the in future, this would be a, a very nice goal to reach. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Cameron, please. 
Oh, yeah, thanks for a uh, really interesting presentation. Um, so the input into the model is that, um, I know you said that you take into account um, kind of baseline characteristics and then obviously the, the anatomy from the images, um, but are there any kind of functional um, measures that go into that? Um, what do you mean by functional, more specific? So like anything to do with flow across the valve or ejection fraction, those kind of things, do they, are they included no. in, the, in the data set? Thanks. Uh, Valeria, you have to unmute yourself. Sorry. Um, yeah, I was saying that um, indeed this is a bit of a weakness of the work because what we lacked was a comprehensive uh, set of clinical cases and what you mentioned indeed is uh, very relevant, but having the data from nine different centers, it was really difficult to gather um, a more homogeneous data set. So I think that could also um, improve the model if we had more clinical baseline. So it's a very uh, good observation. Thank you. So a little bit uh, um, stretching this question. So do you think that your workflow could in somehow give us some peri procedure information which, which you would need to optimize your workflow because maybe an on the spot kind of uh, data will give you immediate feedback to the physician. Is that so also some of the considerations? Yes, yes, indeed. So, for example, papers, other peri procedural information that are relevant is pre or post dilation of the valve. Um, and as you say, this could give a better insight indeed. Okay, thanks. Pablo, you raised your hand and then it came down. Was you had similar questions or an additional yeah, question? Kind of similar, but trying to go a bit a bit deeper in the guts of the mechanistic model. Uh, we all know that those mechanistic models are going to depend on assumptions, on model parameters, uh, tissue properties, on things that we can really personalize to the patient. And I was wondering how much room, Valeria, do you think there is in studying the sensitivity of the predicted value? Of this algorithm to those down in the in the pipeline or those deep model parameters, and I guess that it's very difficult to validate those pressures that you're predicting. Those pressures, those forces, are the ones that seems to be predictive, and maybe yes, I need indeed. to validate the model parameters is to see which forces you that are computed end up being the most predictive of the uh, conduction abnormalities. That is the variable that you can observe. Yes, uh, I investigated this a little bit, and indeed the most predictive parameters are the contact pressure and the contact pressure index that we have from simulations. Um, and uh, I did not mention that, but uh, as Peter also showed yesterday, these uh, computer simulations and all the parameters that were the, are relevant to the simulations were validated against post-operative data. So there was a calibration process um, before. So what I'm using now is basically a uh, functioning uh, simulation tool and this uh, allows to have um, how to say uh, reliable uh, pressure indices and uh, what I wanted to highlight is that despite having not so uh, not such a large data set would, would allow for a better modeling from the statistical point of view uh, the mechanistic insight was key here to drive the accuracy of the model because uh, what we could not have from uh, a large data set we could pitch in with the uh, exact extraction of uh, pressure on the anatomy. Thank you. Philip? Yeah, uh, we actually, just to follow up on Pablo's comment, uh, we had a discussion uh, yesterday with Peter de Jagere, who's also worked on this project. And it seems like, uh, uh, of course, the pressure, the maximum pressure and the region of interest uh, parameters are a reflection of all the other anatomic characteristics of the patient that are usually included in uh, prediction of conduction and normality. So it's like a end variable, which is influenced by a lot of other things. And if 
we don't have it in this paper. We can't really say why the contact pressure is higher specifically, but in, in the end, that's the only important thing because that's what's pressing the bundle branch and that's what's causing the, um, the blockage. So in a way, this paper couldn't capture why, but I think that's a good question. What's influencing the pressure there? Yeah, and to follow up on this, <clears throat> and maybe a little bit outside the box, uh, Valeria. So now it's mostly a valve which is used for a stenotic in aortic stenosis, correct? Yes. So, and that's a very high pressure difference. So there are also other abnormalities, which is uh, the, the regurgitation. I think if you would have regurgitation patients which have a completely different uh, pressure drop, this might also help you in your workflow to determine which is most important. You have to take into account that it's a completely different kind of valve which you would need because it's not calcified and you cannot apply so much pressure, but also the pressure distribution will be different. So I just had this thought that this might be helping you with determining which features are most important for the patient, uh, also from synodic valve. Yes, thank you. I believe it's, it's